chapter 4, verse 11. We have Mark chapter 1 and verse 13, and Luke 4 and verse 13. So those are the parallel areas of this passage. Melissa, we'll get you to start if you don't mind. We're going to do Matthew chapter 4. Yes, please. Right. Then the devil left him, and the angels attended him. So that was pretty straightforward. The temptation is over. And now Jesus is being ministered to by angels. So he's being refreshed. So remember, he was going through this period of time of... of waiting on God, spending time in preparation for the ministry that is about to begin. He's been in the wilderness, and I suggested to us that he's in the wilderness of Perea rather than the wilderness of Judea. So on the eastern side of the Jordan River, that wilderness, rather than the wilderness on the western side. So Jesus has been in the wilderness 40 days. We're going to come back to that as we see Him coming to His disciples, although they're not yet His disciples. They, they haven't yet met Him. So Mark gives us the same picture in Mark 1 and verse 13, and angels uh, ministered to Him. Luke tells us that the devil departed from Him until an opportune time. So Satan's going to attempt to tempt him again and try to derail his mission. But of course we know he will be unsuccessful. So his ministry is not launched by the selection of his disciples. His ministry is launched by his baptism and going into the wilderness. Do you remember the parallels, any of the parallels with Exodus? With, his, with the wilderness temptation? All right, so he's in the same region that they would have been in just prior to going into the Promised Land. Yeah, so... Keep in mind that we're looking at this in the, through the eyes or the backdrop, if you will, of the book of Exodus and Joshua. But there's other elements that are involved throughout the Old Testament that will be brought into play. So we want to see the ministry of Jesus, not just as a standalone, okay, he was born uh, in Bethlehem and then he grew up in Nazareth and then started his ministry east of the Jordan River and then went back up to Galilee, spent some time in Jerusalem and back and forth throughout that, went to the cross, uh, was crucified and rose again the third day and ascended 40 days thereafter. There's more involved in, as we unite, not as we unite, we recognize how the ministry of Jesus is part of the plan of redemption. As a matter of fact, it's not just part of, it is the plan of redemption, and history is part of that. So it all ties into it. So we want to be seeing the ministry of Jesus in that context. So have your eyes and your ears tuned to these sorts of things if you can begin picking up on what's taking place. So John chapter 1 is where we want to go now. We're going to go to verse 19. We're going to go to verse 28. Todd, we'll go with you and we'll see what's taking place here. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jesus born, sent priests and Levites to ask him, 
who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who were sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah, the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This is all happened at Bethany on the other side of Jordan, where John was baptized. So there are those that are coming from Jerusalem in order to see what's taking place in around the Jordan because there's quite a stir going on. Now, uh, I meant to bring down my my map. Would you mind getting that for me, please? Sorry to um, inconvenience you with that. But we want to appreciate what's going on with the priests, the Levites. They're coming from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? We can't really appreciate what kind of a, of a buzz and a stir that is going on so that they would be coming all the way from Jerusalem to where John is baptizing. Because it's not just down the road that this is taking place. So as soon as Deb returns with the map, we'll have a look at it so we can get an appreciation for uh, what's going on. She is, she's very fast. Thank you, hon. All right, yeah, so you can, yeah, that's great idea. Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm gonna hold this up and, and so you can view it on there. But remember, John is baptizing on the east side of the Jordan River, so find the Dead Sea. And just above the Dead Sea, the middle of the Dead Sea runs the Jordan River all the way to the Galilee. Uh, the Sea of Galilee. So just to the right and just to the north of the Sea of Galilee is the area of Bethany. So you probably see that on the map. Bethany is located there. Um, it'll say Plains of Moab, just above the Dead Sea, way down. So find the Dead Sea, go up literally just a fraction of an inch, and you're going to find Bethany to the right to the east of the Jordan River. Do you see it there? All right, so I'll get you to have a look here. This is the vicinity. If it's not listed specifically on that map, it might be too small to see. Uh, but nevertheless, here it is, just above the Dead Sea. So here is Bethany. And Jericho, or excuse me, Jerusalem is to the west. So if you find the tip of the Dead Sea, go west and you're going to see Jerusalem. It's in purple, I think, on that map. So Bethany is here. Jerusalem is right here. So they're coming from Jerusalem out basically into the wilderness or the start of the wilderness to find out what's going on. So Jerusalem is where all of the hub of religious activity is taking place in Judea. But there's something going on out in the wilderness, the beginning, start of the wilderness in Bethany. And so they're sending these priests. They've got to go down the Jericho Road into the area of Jericho. That's a very mountainous region. It's about 19 miles and it's not flat. It's very curved and it's going up and down and up and down. And finally it comes down to the Jordan Valley Plateau and they're there's a significant event going on with John. So that's why they're coming. And they're trying to figure out who is this guy. They're not investigating every Tom, Dick, and Harry or every uh, Levi, Naphtali, and uh, Hezekiah in order to, 
to, to see what kind of stirs are taking place. But John is preaching a, a message of repentance and, uh, and he's baptizing people. So it's more than just people coming to Jerusalem, going into the mikveh, the ritual baths for cleansing. There's a lot of people coming out to where John is baptizing. This is not a, a really busy thoroughfare. People are deliberate in their coming. Do we understand? Do we, can we get a grasp of, of that picture? So, these Levites and priests uh, um, came from Jerusalem to find out who he is. And then we find out there's some coming from the Sanhedrin. So, we've got Pharisees, we've got Sadducees coming out, we've got the Levites. Uh, so, the Sadducees are, are part of the, the Levitical system. Verse 24, those were sent. Uh, we're from the Pharisees, so we've got some of them. And John is telling them that I'm, I'm not the Christ, I'm, I'm not Elijah, I'm not the prophet. And they're wondering, okay, who are you? And how does John respond? What does he say? So he quotes out of Isaiah. And he says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And they recognize this as a messianic text, a messianic prophecy. So John, he's not just you know, saying something fancy. They are recognizing he's making a claim to be the one who is the herald of the Messiah. So a herald is one who would go in advance to bring a message to a city of of maybe a report from the battlefield or bring in a report saying there's an army on the march and they're moving toward Jerusalem. They're moving towards Israel, uh, whatever, wherever the boundary was in re relation to where the people uh, were, were populated. And so the herald would go in advance and bring news. You would have a herald that would come when the king was coming to a different part of the country. And he would be making preparations, if you will, make straight the way. Uh, so he'd say, okay, we've got to build up this road. We've got to tear this road down. We've got to repair the potholes and, and so on. This is John's claim. So it's not a small deal. You didn't have every day people laying hold of biblical prophecy saying that I am the fulfillment of this. So they're trying to validate whether or not he is actually who he claims to be. Then we have, look at verse 29, is then the next day. All right, so in verse 19, this is the testimony of John. So we've got Levites and priests coming to him. That's the first day. Then the next day, there are, uh, we've got John seeing Jesus coming toward him. So that's day two. Then have a look at verse 35. Again, the next day, so now this is day three. And then down in verse 43, the following day. So that's day four. So from the time that we see John's ministry beginning, uh, as far as John the Apostle starts detailing it. Because Luke and Matthew and Mark have already told us that John's ministry has begun, and we see now Jesus has been baptized. This is that inner coming on the end of the, the 40 days of temptation for Jesus in the wilderness when they come to him. So... Four days before, uh, excuse me, two days before Jesus comes back on the scene in Bethany, we've got the, uh, the, the Levites, the Sadducees, the Pharisees coming to check out John. Then Jesus is seen coming towards him the next day. I said two days before, one day before, all right? So on the second day of, of where John picks up this narrative. So he says, how, how, how does he describe him? Behold what? Lamb of God. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. 
It's interesting that he uses that phrase to speak about Jesus. He could have described him in many different ways, but he calls him the Lamb of God. What pictures from the Old Testament is he drawing from when he calls him the Lamb of God? Sacrificial system. And bringing it right back um, to the beginning of that, which would be the foremost picture of a, of a substitutionary death of an animal on behalf of, of the nation? What would be a picture of that? I'm not talking all the way back to Adam and Eve. But where, what is it? Passover. A Passover. So Exodus chapter 12, he's bringing them back to the Pascal lamb. The lamb that was slain, which, which was this, the picture of their redemption. Because the blood of the lamb put upon the doorposts of their houses was that was by, by which the lives of the firstborn were spared. Then we have another picture of the lamb, very prominent, which is very messianic. And it's in the book of Isaiah. And you know it as Isaiah chapter 53. So we've got the Pascal lamb, which takes it back to their formation as a nation. Their identity was formed as they're, uh, they're getting ready to leave Egypt. So the very um, climax of that symbol was the Passover lamb. Then we've got the messianic promise that there is one who will come, will take away your sins as a lamb led before its shearers is silent. This is that same lamb. This is the very lamb that we've been anticipating. So behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So uh, I want to have those on here just so that we have it drawn to our attention. Exodus chapter 12 would be the Passover lamb and Isaiah chapter 53 is the messianic promise, anticipation of this lamb coming. So here John is saying he is here. So he's calling himself the forerunner, the herald. And that's out of Isaiah chapter 40. And then he calls Jesus the lamb uh, that takes away the sin of the world, which is referring to Isaiah chapter 53. So he's, he's bringing it in close connection together with this fulfillment. And he speaks of Jesus in verse 30 in a, in a particular way. He says, He who was, um, this is he of whom he said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me because he was before me. So after me speaks of his humanity and before me speaks of his divinity. So after him, in reference to he comes onto the scene after John begins his ministry, and also in, the, in respect to the fact that he is six months younger than Jesus. So chronologically, he was not born until after John was already born. So he's after me, but he was before me. Speaking of his, the dual uh, nature of Jesus, his divinity and his humanity. And he's fully God and fully man. He didn't set aside his divinity in order to become a man. He is fully God and fully man and will be now throughout eternity as he is our representative and he ever lives to make intercession for us. Ever. So he knows, he, he, he then describes how he knows how to, to have had identified Jesus. So let's look at that just for a minute as we get ready to see Jesus calling his first disciples. Look at verse 32. Uh, let's, look at, let's take it from 31. 31 to 34. And Deb, have you read yet? I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. 
I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Notice what John says about the reason he came baptizing. Look at it in verse 31. Why, what, what is the reason he gives for coming to baptize? Yeah, so through baptism. As a result of the beginning of his ministry and baptizing, cleansing people uh, symbolically for, as a repentance unto God is preparing the way for Jesus to come onto the scene. That's why he began. And of course, Jesus was baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness. We've already dealt with that a couple of weeks ago. And he tells those that are gathered, this is how I know this is him. It wasn't just somebody that felt right or something like that, but I was very specifically told that I was told very specifically that this is how I would know to identify him. That when I see the Spirit descending upon him and remaining on him, that this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So he basically says, so I've given you my testimony, and so it stands. This is the Son of God. Now, if you're a Pharisee or a Sadducee, is that good news or bad news? Good news, they just don't know it. <laughs> I was going to say, it should be good news, but they don't see it as that. <laughs> so at this point, it's not that they don't see it as that, it's that they're investigating the claim. They've not yet formed an opinion. They want to know what is going on, and they're collecting information. In other words, they're gathering the evidence. But once they begin to evaluate the evidence, as they're anticipating, I mean, they, they're the ones that every daily they're, they're anticipating the arrival of Messiah. So they are the first ones on the scene, basically, when they hear rumblings going on, and it's been going on for more than 40 days. How do we know that? Because Jesus has been in the wilderness for 40 days. And he's the next day for 39. He arrives on the, after the next day. So he's been there for, so I guess, 40 days coming in. Uh, shows up on the scene. And John's been preaching this baptism of repentance prior to when Jesus was baptized. So probably a few months couple of months, a month, uh, where he's been baptizing and beginning this, this uh, ministry of repentance. So as the crowds gather, uh, hype, if you will, buzz starts happening, and now they show up on the scene, and it's not by coincidence that they show up at the same time that Jesus makes his appearance. So they could have come on day 27, well, Jesus is another 13 days away from, from showing up, right? But they come the day before he comes on the scene. They didn't go back that same night. They would have made camp and would have investigated further, and John gives this testimony the next day. Here he is, the one that I've been preaching about and uh, alerting you to. Here he is. That's him right there. Well... It's not like Jesus says, well, you know, here I am, and goes, uh, this takes things up. It's not until the next day. So this could have been later in the day where he says, behold, the Lamb of God. Then Jesus, the next day, John is standing with two of his disciples and looks at Jesus as he walked, and see, he says again, behold, the Lamb of God. And notice what the disciples end up doing. So Melissa, I'm going to take, I get you to take it if you can. Um, verse 37, and we're going to take it down to verse 39. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus said, saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying spent 
This is uh, this is interesting because to understand the significance of what's going on. Well, let me ask: Do you under do you recognize the significance of what's going on with these two disciples of John? Then hearing Jesus, and they begin to follow Jesus. What's the significance of this? All right, hearing, pardon me? Okay, his ministry starting. Who is Jesus to them? They're not sure, but he's for sure this, a rabbi. So what do they do? They begin to follow him. This is not yet the selection of his disciples in the official sense. That's not going to come down, come to pass until sometime down the road when all 12 now have been gathered. Right now, how many disciples does Jesus have? Okay, at this very point, he has two that are attempting to be his disciples, right? They don't know anything about him except what John's been preaching, that one is going to come after me, who will, I baptize you with water, but one coming after me, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So that's what they know about him. This is their first introduction to him. They might have been on the scene when Jesus was baptized 40 days earlier. We're not sure when they became followers or disciples of John. These are men that are from Galilee. So they live up in this area. But they're down in this region and have been staying here for a significant period of time to be considered disciples of John. Because a disciple of somebody is not somebody who just casually shows up today and now I follow you and tomorrow look, at he's a disciple. It's somebody who has devoted themselves to the rabbi, to the teacher. Being from Galilee, they would have been raised with this mindset. From, from infancy, they would have been taught the scriptures. They would have been enrolled in synagogue school. And for those that were more exceptionally adept at learning the Torah, the Old Testament, which can also take in the full scriptures, the, the Hebrew scriptures, then they would continue on in their studies. And those that seem to be incredibly astute, then a rabbi might decide, I'll take you on at the age of 13, 12, 13, when they are being bar mitzvahed or bat mitzvahed, if it's a girl, and invite them to be a disciple. Very rare in that time that a, pers a young person would say, can I be your disciple? Disciples were chosen by the rabbis, not rabbis chosen by the disciples. But in Galilee, it was an aspiration to be a follower of a rabbi, to be a disciple, to be chosen by a rabbi. It was of the utmost honor that could be given, but it was for the select few. Those that didn't have the aptitude or weren't particularly bent that way, if you will, then they went about developing a trade. And if it was apprenticed with a, another family member or with your father or with a neighbor, then that's what they would then begin to do. And the girls would be getting prepared then for uh, being developed into wives when they when marrying time would come. So how to take care of a household and so on. So here we have these two young men. And who are they? These first two disciples. All right, so one of them is Andrew. Who's the other? It doesn't say. <laughs> All right, Andrew. How do we know he's Andrew? In verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, the other guy that's not named, he's... Pardon me? Nameless. nameless. At this point, he's nameless. 
but he is John, the brother of James. This is John. This is how John, the apostle, as he's writing, chooses to identify himself. He will include himself in the, 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 the story line, but he doesn't call himself by name. The disciple Jesus loved, or then the other disciple arrived at the tomb, or things like that. But he never draws attention to himself. He just bears witness that he saw and heard these things by including himself in the narration, the story, the text, but he doesn't draw the attention to himself. So, the first two disciples are Andrew and John. So here their curiosity is about Jesus. As they were looking at Jesus, verse 36, notice what happens. John standing with two of his disciples, John and Andrew. Looking at Jesus as he walked along, John says to them, Behold the Lamb of God. And then they followed Jesus. Why? Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what is John really saying when he tells... So John the baptizer, what is he saying to John and Andrew when he says, Behold the Lamb of God? He's saying to them, Guys, what are you staying with me for? Vamos. Go with him. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why just those two, but he turns with them as... Um, he's standing there with two of his disciples. It doesn't say he's standing there with ten of them, and then out of them he selects these two. So he's standing with two of his disciples at this point. And so he's already said yesterday, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he's telling everybody, your focus needs to be on him. This is the one that I've been preaching about. This is why you need to repent. He's the one who's going to establish the kingdom. The next day, John and Andrew are with him, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. In other words, not just pay attention to, to this guy. He's going to do big things. He's saying, You leave me, and now you follow him. So it's, it's like the biggest referral that you can get. John is referring his disciples to Jesus. You understand? It's not just them coming along out of curiosity and saying, would you consider us to, you know, we'd like to hang out and would you consider us to be your disciples? John the baptizer has handed them off. He's passed the baton, if you will, to the one who is going to bring home the race. So, Jesus turned and seeing them, he says, what are you looking for? What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? That's an interesting question. Why, why where are you staying? Are they just curious, where's your home? Are they just curious, where's your, where, are you hang, where, where are you hanging your... your uh, caught tonight? This is a request. This is them saying, we want to follow you. Wherever it is you're staying, we want to stay with you. And remember, Jesus, where is he staying? Up until this point, he's been staying in the wilderness. Now, he's getting ready to go to Galilee. So, Jesus turns to them after they say, he says to them, Come and see. In other words, it's enough for you to know that I'm allowing you to come with me. I'm asking, I'm inviting you to follow me. 
So it's not just a curiosity, just check this thing out. These are men who have been raised with an eye towards the possibility of being chosen by a rabbi. They're not just checking things out. They are hoping, they're trusting, that based upon John's referral, I mean, John is, they, they, they thought they made it, in a sense, as Jewish young men to become disciples of a rabbi when John invited them to be his disciples. Now, they're being handed over to whom John had been pointing towards. But for them, they don't fully get to grasp it. And we see that throughout. We already know that because we've read it before. But keep in mind, we're coming at this with fresh eyes and fresh ears. So they came and they saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. Why does John give that detail? I think there's two reasons. One reason is this. John giving information that couldn't be known otherwise, saying that I am, I was a participant. I was, I was an eyewitness. I experienced this. This happened. This is a firsthand account. And as I recall, it was about the 10th hour. I think another aspect is, as the Holy Spirit is the one who's, right, who's instructing and guiding for the writing of this, what does 10 speak of? The number 10. What is it? Perfection. Ordinal perfection. So things that are coming to um, a sequence, a, a numeric, an ordinal perfection. Also, 10 speaks of testimony. So John's basically saying, this is my testimony. All right, so we already know in verse 40 that one of the ones who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew. And we're told that what relationship he has with another guy who's going to become very um, much a part of this account, Simon Peter's brother. So he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah. So Simon and Andrew, what are they by trade? Fishermen. What are James and John by trade? Yet they're down in the region of Bethany, far from Galilee, where their fishing business is. They've been checking out. that They've become disciples of John the baptizer, John and Andrew. Simon... He's along for, out of curiosity whether or not he's following along with Andrew and he's checking things out, or perhaps he's a disciple of John the Baptizer as well, but he wasn't present yesterday, uh, earlier. Um, yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't present earlier when John the Baptizer said to the two of them, go and follow him. So Andrew brings the testimony. We have found the Messiah. And then John tells us which means or being translated is the Christ. So that when we see Christ from this point on, we know that it is connected to literally this, uh, the Greek version of the Hebrew name Messiah, the Shiach. And the Shiach means literally, I already know, I know you already know this. Mashiach literally means anointed. Anointed. And anointed specifically in reference to the idea of kingship. This is the Messiah. When they said Messiah, they weren't just saying something, a religious term. This was ingrained as part of Israel's, almost like their DNA, part of the fabric of their identity, of who they were. They are without a Messiah at this point in time. They're under the rulership of an ungodly Messiah. An anointed one refers to the king. 
And so we have found the Messiah, the King, the Savior. That's what the King represent, um, ruled as, the, a godly, a righteous King. He ruled as a Savior to deliver His subjects. So what does Andrew do? The first evangelist. He brings Simon to Jesus. Let's read verse 42, Craig, or uh, Todd. <laughs> I always do that with you. I was half right. I always get the last name first. And Sorry about that. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cyprus, which is translated as Peter. All right. Translated as Peter, but literally translated as Peter literally means a stone or a rock. It's interesting that Jesus hasn't met Simon yet, but he already gives him a name, a new name. He says, I tell you that you, Simon, you shall be called Kepha. Cephas or Kephas, which means a, a rock or a stone. And that's why his name, oftentimes you see him as Simon Peter, because Peter is a, is a synonym for Kepha. Well, then we get the next day. So after this event, this is the first. So we've got how many followers of Jesus now? Three. So we have Andrew, John, and now we're going to call him Kephas. Kepha. Don't confuse us. All right, let's, shall, shall, we, shall we keep it as, as we're familiar with it then? If, all right, well, we got right in the text that his name is Cephas. So, Peter. All right, let's take it. Even John translates it. Peter. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, actually, that's the English translation because being translated, it is a stone. So, depends on how you're looking at it from the Greek. So, yeah. All right, Deb, will you take us verse 43... And um, I want us to go down to 46. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. So, now we have not just Peter, Andrew, John, but Jesus now finds Philip and speaks to him. This is the first one said that Jesus says directly to follow me. So Philip, we find out that he's from the same town as Andrew and Peter from Bethsaida. Pardon me? Yes, you were there. So Bethsaida is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. You will have Capernaum is right on the very shore. And then we have Bethsaida. It's very faint here. Uh, Bethsaida is just to the east of Capernaum. Keep in mind that majority of Jesus' disciples are from the region of Galilee. So not only is Philip um, from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, but we've got James and John are living in that vicinity. Capernaum. So they're right in that, they're in the same neighborhood, if you will. And, pardon me? I don't see it. I just see it in the faint stuff. Yeah. 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 It should be, it, it should be on that map. It, uh, yeah, it should be the same. If, yeah, if you just take a look at that and you can show where it is. Mm 
doesn't have it on there. All right, let's take. You can you can send that. It's uh, it's too small to have the extra details, I guess, for that particular aspect. So you'll find Capernaum easily on that map, and then Bethsaida is to the right or the east of that one. And then we have. Yeah. So it has it has Capernaum. All right. All right. Uh, that's fine for right now, thanks. All right, so Jesus the next day, the following day, in verse 43, so now we are the fourth day from when John starts telling us about uh, John the baptizer's experience and so on, all right, the fourth day. And he wanted to go to Galilee, and he finds Philip, and then Philip, he finds Nathaniel, Nathaniel, and said to him, we found him who Moses spoke about, and he gave his name as Jesus of Nazareth. Remember we talked about the branch? He's from, the, from Branchville, the town of the branch, if you will. And Nathaniel, he's, what? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because... Nazareth was on the borderlands, if you will, of the Gentiles. So it was referred to as Nazareth of the Gentiles because the Gentile lands were just beyond that. And so basically they were on the back side of the tracks, the bad side of the tracks. So by reputation, Nathaniel is thinking there, there can't be anything good coming from that. But... Um, it's interesting that Philip says the same thing to him that Jesus said to John and Andrew. Come and see. Well, he, he decides that he's going to come. I want to read 47 to 51, and then we're going to take a trip back to the Old Testament. All right? So, Melissa, let's look at 47 to 51. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He said then, he then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. All right. What I want to do is consider where Jesus was crossing. Remember that he came back to Bethany where John was baptizing. And then we're not told where Jesus was staying. Come and see, he says to John and Andrew. And then Peter joins uh, the team. And then we've got Philip. And then we've got Nathaniel. Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. So he's got to cross the Jordan in order to do that. So he's going to come from the east side of the Jordan, crossing over to the west side of the Jordan. And then he'll go up the Jordan Rift Valley in order to make it back to the area of the Galilee. Remember we're picturing, we're seeing this in the backdrop of, of Exodus and Joshua. And there's another aspect that we're looking at also. So looking at Bethany for a moment, this would be the, re, the same area of crossing that Joshua took the Israelites across the Jordan River when they came into the Promised Land. There was So that was the splitting of the Jordan River and causing the waters to stop up as far as Adam up river. I don't think you guys were here for that. Yes. You were for that one. Okay. The next time that the rivers are, the, the Jordan River is stopped is when? Elijah. Elisha and Elijah. So 2 Kings chapter 2. We find out that Elijah is going to be taken up into heaven in a whirlwind. But just prior to that, Elisha is following him from place to place. And uh, 
He's, he's looking for what God is going to do with his rabbi, his master. Elisha is with Elijah. Hard to keep those two names straight, but if we say it in Hebrew, Elisha and Eliyahu. So Elisha sounds like the Elisha. Eliyahu is literally, it'd be a whole lot easier if that's what it was in English, but for some reason it gets translated as Elijah. Um, so Elijah, he takes off his mantle, off of his shoulders, he rolls it up, and he strikes the Jordan waters, and the waters stop. And this is a picture of, of the power of the prophetic word or the word of God, because Elijah as the prophet represented the very word of God. And then after Elijah, Eliyahu, is taken up into heaven, his mantle falls off of him, Elisha picks it up, and he goes back to the Jordan River, and he says, where is the God of Eliyahu? And takes it, and he strikes the water, and the waters stop flowing. They part. He goes across on dry ground. In the very same area that Jesus is about... Pardon me? One of them says dry, and one says the Holy Spirit. One of them says dry, and the other says... 2 Kings chapter 2. It doesn't give that specific detail, but the waters did part when he went back. Mm -hmm. Jesus, he's going to cross the Jordan, not by stopping the water, but by crossing one of the fords of the Jordan River, so where it is shallower than at other locations. So he's crossing over one of the fords of the wilderness. So David did a similar thing. When he's leaving Jerusalem, fleeing from Absalom, he crosses one of the fords of the river. Second Samuel chapter 19, I think it is for that one. Um, there's other fords that, they end, that are along the entire Jordan uh, River in the Rift Valley. I think when I had mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, I said that there, are, there were a number of, but I didn't give the actual number. There was, there was estimated about 50 crossing places along the Jordan River between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus is getting ready, and he crosses over the Jordan River at one of these fords. So would have lifted his, his robe, and then they would have made through on knee-high or, or low thigh-high water to make it to the other side, and then they will make their way up to uh, Galilee. Why did I bother bringing Elijah into this? We want to bring Elijah into this aspect, consideration along with Moses for a moment. Elijah, he was taken up to heaven in the same vicinity where Jesus was being baptized, and where he returns to where John is baptizing and where the disciples join him. And then he's making his way back across, following in the footsteps now of Elisha, and prior to that would have been Joshua and the nation of Israel. So Jesus crossing the Jordan River, um, showing two things. One, that he is the Joshua, Yahashua, who will lead his people into salvation, into the promises of God. Because Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 6 tells us that Jesus is, or the servant of the Lord, is His covenant, is the covenant of the people. So He is our covenant. In other words, He is the promise, the promises of God. Where 2 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us that in Him all the promises of God find their fulfillment. So Jesus is our covenant. He is the Yahashua who leads us into the promises of God. So that is why I believe that he was tempted in the wilderness of Perea so that when he meets his disciples, his first disciples, that his next act is coming into what was considered the promised land, representing the promises that God would have given, which would find their fulfillment in Jesus. Because God gave promises to Abraham, 
that would be to his seed, as Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3. In verse 16, he says, And the promise is to your seed, meaning one, not seeds, meaning many, and that seed is Jesus. All right? The second aspect is Elisha goes across the river after that miraculous event at that same location. And now, what was Elisha's request of Elijah? That he would have a double portion of his power. What does that mean, a double portion? Who gets the double portion? The firstborn son. Who is Jesus? He's the firstborn son. And so he, we see him going across the Jordan then as the Yahushua who would lead to salvation. And we see him leading across the Jordan in the same power of the Spirit as Elisha did as the firstborn. Receiving, as it were, the double portion. Who would then distribute it to his followers, his disciples. Furthermore, we need to see something else about Elijah. In order to do that, we need to have a look at um, a couple of spots. So, let's have a look at... All right, so here is a picture of me. Deb's just... She's taking the picture. We are on Mount Carmel. All right, so if you have a look at the map, you'll see Mount Carmel. It's along the Mediterranean coast, and it has the little jut out of, um, of the land just above the Sea of Galilee. So you've got to be on the coast of the Mediterranean in order to see it. We're going to see it on the screen here anyway in just a second. So that's uh, me on Mount Carmel. This is looking over or from Mount Carmel into uh, towards the Mediterranean Sea. All right, so here we're going to see something about... Um, Elijah's experience on Mar Mount Carmel because it has a direct bearing on Jesus' time in the wilderness. Can you think of any connections between um, Mo uh, Mount Carmel for Elijah and what happens immediately on the heels of that that correlates or corresponds to Jesus' time in the wilderness? I know Elijah went to Mount Carmel to uh, see God. Okay, so stop there just for a second. I need to get you back. He, he went where? To Mount Carmel. So Mount Carmel is where he started, and that's where he the fire came down, and that's not where he saw the, fi the, the fire, the wind, and the earthquake oh. that I think you're talking about. Oh, okay. But it's the same. Sorry. So you're, you, you're blending... You're, you're getting, you're blending two. So chapter 18 is the fire coming down on Carmel. Chapter 19 is where he makes his way where? If you have a look on the map, you'll see that uh, there's some blue dots. So we've got a blue dot here. Actually, there's two here. There's one here, and there's one down here. So just give me one second while I do this for our online audience. Mount Carmel is the one on the left. Then we've got this second one, which is very close to it. That's Jezreel. And then we've got below that is Beersheba. And then the one below that is Jebel al Yaz or Jaws. That is known as, otherwise as, Mount Sinai or Horeb, Mount Horeb. So... Oh, let me do this here. We'll bring it a little bit closer so you get the appreciation for the vicinity in which we're talking. And then I'm going to bring it in, uh, zoom it a little bit closer yet again. So Mount Carmel is where Elijah had the contest, as it were, with the prophets of Baal. And the power of God is displayed there when, when fire comes down and consumes the sacrifice, right? Then... The prophets of Baal are, are destroyed, they're killed. And then what does Elijah do? Where does he go? He runs to Jezreel. So the next spot right here in the Jezreel Valley, he goes to the city of Jezreel. Remember Ahab went, at, went in a chariot 
And Elijah, the Spirit of God, came upon him, and he ran in the strength of the Spirit of God, and he outran the chariot all the way to Jezreel, in the Jezreel Valley. Who's there? Jezebel. Well, after that demonstration of the power of God on Mount Carmel, what is Elijah's expectation? Everybody's going to turn. Everybody's going to respond to this demonstration. But do they? No, because we see in 1 Kings chapter 19 that indeed they don't, even to the point that um, Jezebel wants to kill him, and then he runs basically for his life, and he goes as far as Beersheba, right here. So the, the blue dot that we've got pretty much in the middle of that picture. All right, so he, he lays down and wants to die. But an angel comes and strengthens him. And then he goes back to sleep. An angel returns and strengthens him with food yet again. Strengthens him for what? The journey that's about to take place. And he's going to go all the way to Mount Horeb, which is also known as Mount Sinai. Sinai. Or the mountain of God. Or the mountain, sorry, mountain of God. Yeah, I, I couldn't hear what you said. All right, so Mount Sinai or the mountain of God. But it's interesting that this, in this instance, it's called Mount Horeb, not Mount Sinai. What happened on Mount Sinai prior to this? What is it most recognized for, most well known for? Ten Commandments. The nation of Israel, has they're fresh out of Egypt. The Lord has led them to, to be in, watered in the wilderness with a, with a miracle there in chapter 16 of Exodus. And then we end, we end up seeing by chapter 19, they come to the mountain of God, also referred to there as Mount Sinai. In Exodus 3, it's referred to as Horeb, the mountain of God. Sinai in chapter 19. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, he goes to Mount Horeb. Any idea what Horeb means? It means dry. Mount dry. Mount desolate is literally what the name means. Interesting, isn't it? So the Lord leads him to go to this mountain. So to a dry mountain, essentially. Well, Elijah wants to be refreshed, but God brings him here and what's the experience that he has while he's here? He's in a cave, and when he looks out of the cave, what happens? Summarize it for me. So this is chapter 19, right, of 1 Kings. What's taking place? A powerful wind towards the mountains of heart to shatter the rock. Say it a bit louder. The mountains, the, the, a powerful wind toward the mountains of heart shattered the rocks. Okay. What else? An earthquake? Yeah, and, and what else? A fire. And a fire. But God was not in any of those. What are those representing? Power, right? It's representing the power of God. What did Elijah experience in Carmel? The power of God. Is the power of God, is, is raw might going to be the thing that changes people's minds? So what does what's the thing that that we see that God is in? The gentle whisper. The gentle whisper. In the Hebrew, it's the kol de mama daiga. The rabbis say that it's the voice you can hear, or you can only hear when you're listening for it. If you're not listening, you'll miss it. Why did God bring him all the way to Horeb to show him that? Trying to get him to listen. To to listen. But why Horeb? Why couldn't he do that in Beersheba? Why couldn't... Pardon me? Too many distractions. Too many distractions? Okay. All right. Where do we see the fire, the wind, and the earthquake on Mount Horeb prior to this? Giving of the law in Exodus chapter 19. We see all of these elements, but what is it a demonstration thereof? His 
power, right? And he's showing himself in Exodus 19 to be the God who by strength rescued the people of Israel out of Egypt. But from that point on, what does God say he wants to do with his people? Think about Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. <laughs> Blank. <laughs> I know. So, so right. Pardon me? Yeah, build a tabernacle so that I can dwell among my people. What is the context of 25 and verse 8? Moses is on Mount Sinai. The people are down below waiting. And Moses is there for how many days? 40. How many days did it take for Elijah, Elijah to get from Beersheba to Mount Horeb? 40 days. How long was Jesus in the wilderness for? 40 days. 40 days. How long was Israel in the wilderness for? 40 years based on the 40 days they were in the land of promise, but they rejected the promises of God. So a year for each day they were in the land. See, they see some connections starting to form with 40 and with Moses and the Israelites and Elijah. All right, so what does that have to do with Jesus and his disciples? No idea. <laughs> All right. I can guess, but I'll be wrong. So. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's have a look at this picture. It has to do with the pyramids. All right, so what does the pyramids have to do with this? We have no idea. <laughs> All right. Why did the Egyptians Why did the Egyptians build the pyramids? Uh, to well, it was their graves. Graves? Okay, yeah, graves of the pharaohs. Yeah. And they thought it would be their afterlife like they would Okay. Afterlife. All right. That's part of it. And one of the other reasons they built the pyramids was it represented the mountains of their gods. In other words, the places where their gods dwelt. The gods dwelt upon mountains. But there's no real mountains in, the, the proper, in, in Egypt proper where they were worshiping. So they had to build artificial mountains so that their gods could dwell thereupon. But their gods, were they had some 20,000 different gods that you could identify, that they could identify. And their gods were those that by their, their traditions, by their teachings, had, had, had power and the, the earth grew up or came up out of the waters. Sounds like Genesis in a sense there, doesn't it? But it speaks of the gods of Egypt were the ones that by their power, they brought these things to pass. So um, when you've got, let's see if we can, where their gods were, were responsible for bringing these into existence, that if you are the author of everything, then that author has authority over everything which refers to power, right? Power. Now, Egypt was a world power for how many years? Any idea? For what kind of duration? We know it's more than decades. Okay, so it's so a thousand years maybe. They were a world power for thousands of years. Think about it this way. When Abraham came on the scene, these pyramids were already a thousand years old. So Abraham is 2000 from the beginning, after Adam. Yeah. You're familiar with Cleopatra? Which? Mark Anthony? Yes, Mark Anthony. <laughs> So that would be during the, the period uh, about, well, just prior, about within the 100 years prior to Christ. All of this is going on in Egypt. And Egypt is still a dominant power to ma in many respects in the world of that day. We are closer to Cleopatra than Cleopatra was to the pyramids. So that just gives you an idea. If the pyramids were a 1,000 years before Abraham or thereabouts, 
we're talking of about 3,000 years at least of world influence and power. So bring it back to Genesis chapter 1. Yeah, now it's, it's, it's such a shell of, of anything in the past, right? Yeah. All right, so it speaks about the power and might of Egypt, because Egypt was, a, was an influence and a power for thousands of years. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. What are the first words of God on record? Let there be light. And that's a royal decree, as it were. That's a decree of the king, of the creator, the one who holds all authority. And the one who holds all the authority holds all of the power. So he creates by his power. But he doesn't come in to try to change people by that same power. He speaks and Things come into existence, light, matter, space, time, all that, that uh, was created, all that came into existence was by the power of His Word. He speaks, the stars respond. He speaks, the grass grows. But He gives a command and man, He speaks, He gives a command, but what does man do? He has a choice and he disobeys. See, God speaks and these things result from it, but when he speaks to man, he doesn't do it to enforce his power on us, but rather he gives his command to bring his influence upon us. See the difference? I can, for I can force you by brute strength to do certain things if I wanted to. I could constrain you. I won't, I will not, I wouldn't. <laughs> but do you understand that, that as a husband, I could make you do stuff by sheer brute force. But is it going to be according to your desire? And is it going to give you a heart <laughs> to respond? Absolutely not. Same thing with our kids. We could force them to do things or not do things because I'm bigger than you, right? I think of, of our grandson that... Uh, when he's doing something that he ought not to be doing, now don't do that, Cade. And if he continues, what does Caitlin do? She gets up and she picks him up, force, <laughs> and keeps him away from what he ought not to be doing, that sort of thing. But it doesn't change the life. God works in humanity by means of influence. And that's what he was showing um, Elijah. I can show my power to demonstrate that I am God. And Egypt, when I brought you into Egypt in the zenith, the peak of their power and influence. Why? So that I could rescue you out of it to show them and the world and show you that there's no God like me. There's no God besides me. But I showed my power not to coerce you, but I showed my power to show you who I am above every other God so that you will know that I am God and that now you will obey me, not because of my power, but because of my influence. In Exodus 19, he says, I carried you on eagle's wings. What does that speak of? It speaks of two things. One, his power. The other, of his intimacy. Because what do eagles carry on their wings? Their chicks, or on, on their pinions, on their back. It speaks of their wings, but on their back. So what do eagles carry on their backs? Their babies, their young, their family. And they drop them. And <laughs> Here we go, we're going to take you to the highest height and let you go. But why, does, why do they drop them? To catch them again so that they will learn how to fly. Yeah, exactly. But it's all about influence. You and I have a choice. So when God brings Elijah to Horeb, he doesn't appear in the demonstrations of power, but in the quiet, intimate voice to influence. So 
what happens to Elijah after Mount Horeb? He goes back into Israel, and what does he do? He selects Elisha as his disciple. And what did they do together? They establish a school of the prophets, which essentially was a school of disciples. Uh, kind of, but you have Elijah coming in there, and, and he and Elisha are basically establishing something more. Because Elijah was basically a, a, a loner yeah. up until this point. Okay. So what's he establishing? He's establishing disciples. Okay. I see that, yeah. And bringing it back now to Jesus, what has he just spent time doing? Forty days in the wilderness as it reflects Moses, as it on Mount Sinai, as it reflects Elijah on Mount Sinai, Horeb. But a dryness, it speaks of a wilderness, a parched land, so that you can learn to do what? Hear the voice of God. And what has Jesus been doing for the past 40 days? Listening to the voice of God. And as he comes back to Bethany, he brings around him disciples, not to show his power to coerce, although he will show his power, so that people will know that's one of the testimonies, things that testify of him or bear witness of him. But primarily, what is he doing? He's speaking. He's teaching. He's telling. He's leading. He's serving. Leading by example. Because he was a rabbi of a different sort. Because a rabbi, even today, it's, it's considered that if you are a disciple of a rabbi, that that rabbi takes prominence over your own family, even your own father. So if, if both your rabbi and your father were in peril, in danger, then you would rescue first. You would make an attempt to rescue your rabbi before you rescued your father. This is a type of devotion to the rabbi. But what did Jesus do? He turns that on its head and he says, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And then he says, and he shows an aspect of that in John 13, where he washes their feet. But now I'm getting ahead of myself because we haven't journeyed that far yet. But that's just to, so that we can draw some connections in the ministry of Jesus, his purpose. And so when he comes back to Bethany, on the east of this Jordan, because there's another Bethany near Jer Jerusalem. We'll not get the two confused, just so you understand. And he selects some to start following him so that they can learn to listen to the voice of God as well, as is exemplified in the Word made flesh who came to dwell among us. So this is the selection of these um, these first disciples.